while while we're waiting, uh, on behalf of the Temple Emanuel Israel Action Committee, I want to thank you all for, for coming tonight uh, to hear Avi Posnick, the Executive Director of Stand With Us for the Northeast in New England. And I want to thank uh, Alice Bresman for her hard work in making this program possible. And I would also uh, like to acknowledge our uh, community partners um, whose names I will uh, share on the screen. And um, if people have uh, questions, there will be a Q&A period at the end if people have questions. You should uh, use the chat function to submit them to Temple Emanuel. And I will be uh, reviewing them and uh, and uh, uh, asking them uh, towards the end of the program. Thank you. And uh, I'll turn it over to Alice. With so many of you here tonight, I know you're all aware of the increasing rise of anti-Semitism in our country and throughout the world. I want to welcome you tonight and really value your acknowledgement that this program tonight is critical. Our community partners demonstrate how much we as Jews need to come together and work together to combat anti-Semitism and what's happening on our college campuses and in our high schools and through K through 12. Our focus tonight will primarily be our college campuses where our students, our Jewish students are experiencing harassment and many of them fear for their physical safety. Our Jewish professors on campus are also experiencing this. And throughout the country in some of our high schools, this is happening as well. Our program tonight, Turmoil on Campus, learn how Jewish students are coping with standing with Israel and how we can help is both timely and critical. We are fortunate to have our speaker, Avi Posnick, which David mentioned is the executive director of Stand With Us Northeast and on I think most of you probably know what Stand With Us is, but for those who may not, it's an international education organization that supports the rights in the world. Since joining Stand With Us in 2007, Avi has been growing Stand With Us's outreach to community leaders, building coalitions, educating, and empowering them to fight anti-Semitism. Before joining Stand With Us, Avi attended Yeshiva University, where he majored in political science. He was active in many student groups and was the founder of UPAC, which is still active today. He was also very active in high school, leading many campaigns and public demonstrations to support Israel and to call for the extradition of Nazi war criminals living in the US and countries around the world. Given Avi's professional experience, which is outstanding in his field, but also what he did in college and high school, he can really relate well to our high school and college students and help them with what they're facing today. Unfortunately, for those of you who were just got on, Avi's having trouble, technical problems, sadly, and it's looking like he's not fixing them. He had tried 
uh, signing on earlier and everything worked. I think Avi can hear us and we were able to hear him. So I apologize that I think for now, we're just going to be hearing Avi. Avi, are you there? I am here and I apologize for the technical difficulties. Alice, as you said, I have some professional background in this field, but for whatever reason, the computers are not the uh, the professional thing. So I can see everyone and I apologize that you can't see me, but I can, I can see in here. Avi, may I ask you, can we send some of your slides following the program? We are sending a report. Yes. And, okay, so and if, we, it, and if I have the ability, I'll be able to put some of the links in the chat um, as I mentioned them. So you'll see some of them, but then I'm happy to compile everything and uh, have you send it out. Okay, so I hope you'll all stay, listen to Avi, and be assured that you'll get his visuals and hopefully a link to the video he was going to show after the program. So yeah. again, thank you for your patience, everyone. And uh, Avi, you're on. Thank you so much, Alice. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to everyone who is here this evening. Thank you to all of the partners, as was mentioned. Uh, my name is Avi Poznik. I am the Northeast and New England Director for Stand With Us. And I wanna just begin briefly by, you know, Alice talked a little bit about Stand With Us, but I wanna give a little bit more detail and then go into what we're seeing on the college campuses uh, how are students dealing with it and how can, how are we helping and how can we all help uh, on this call? So just very briefly, uh, as I know many of you are aware and I've mentioned, uh, I've read about Stand With Us before. Stand With Us is an international education organization with the goal of educating students and the general public about Israel and empowering them to educate their peers and fight anti-Semitism. Uh, when Stand With Us began in 2001, it was the height of the second intifada and we saw a lot of misinformation that was being said about Israel and the organization began to provide people with information, to provide them with facts. And we soon heard about the issues happening on college campuses. We saw the all the different speakers that were happening. We saw what was known and to this day is known as the quote unquote, the apartheid wall, or as we like to call it, the wall of hate. Um, and helping students on college campuses, providing them with the support, providing them with the resources that they need became our bread and butter. That was something that we, and to this day, spend a lot of time on. But for us, about 12 or 13 years ago, we realized that if we really want to make a difference on college campuses, we need to start sooner. The education has to start sooner. And we started doing work within the high school space, starting with the Jewish day schools, the youth groups, and continuing to the public high schools as well. So working with the Jewish students there, working with many of the non-Jewish students as well. And so this is something that um, we continue to do. And a number of years ago, pre-COVID, we opened up a middle school division as well. Um, again, realizing that we wanted to begin this education and engagement with these students at a younger age so that as they get older, as they get to college campuses, they have the foundation, they have the structure and support they need to educate their peers and to educate others about Israel and respond to a lot of the things that we're seeing, that they were seeing uh, on the campuses. What we're seeing on college campuses today, and all the things that I mentioned are, you know, those three departments that I didn't even talk about yet, which I'll get into, the social media, the legal department that we have, our Center for Combating Anti-Semitism, our Holocaust Education Center, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that uh, shortly. We're all obviously concerned, um, as Alice had mentioned, about what we're seeing on college campuses today. Um, what we're seeing on college campuses predated October 7th. Um, Unfortunately, what we've seen since October 7th is really an explosion of anti-Semitism and the issues that we have been dealing with up until then have now essentially, you know, are continuing on steroids. Um, many people are, you know, are of course waking up um, to what is happening. And I think many people have been seeing these protests that are happening, all these events and realizing, hey, wait a second, we have a problem on the campus. What students are dealing with are, are now is really a feeling of isolation, of they're experiencing bullying, they're experiencing uh, intimidation. Uh, and in too many cases, unfortunately, there have been cases of assault, physical assaults as well. 
Some students are feeling anxious to walk around campuses, and not only Jewish students, but the general student population very often is unable to have a normal campus life, to have a normal campus experience because of all of disruptions. Imagine being not even a Jewish student necessarily, but you're a student in the library, you're a student who's you know studying and you hear you know, students passing by banging on the windows, you're trying to get to class and there are students who are blocking the entrance for students to, to get to class. So this is something that doesn't just affect you know, our students, but it's, it's having an impact on the campus environment as a whole as well. In addition to the student activities, the student incidents that we're seeing, we're seeing cases where professors are involved in, in the protest, in contributing to the in-class intimidation, in contributing to a lot of the statements uh, that are being put out. And I'll get to some more things about the professors uh, a little bit later. But like I said before, you know, following the following October 7th, we really saw an awakening. Um, we saw, we've seen people really wake up and realize and acknowledge that there is this problem. And it has shown who our friends are and who we thought were our friends. Um, and in many cases, we've seen you know, the masks come off, the masks of you know, hiding this anti-Semitism. However, while in many cases we're seeing the masks off, we're still seeing many masks on campuses that are on. And I, what I mean by that, both physically, first of all, is that for those of you who have been seeing some of these protests, for those of you who have been seeing some of these events that are that are happening on the campuses, we're seeing students wear these masks, they're hiding their identities, they're hiding behind those masks so that they can't be punished, that they can't be identified. And this is something that we have spoken to the many, the general counsels on a number of campuses to say, uh, first of all, in some cities, during a protest, you are not allowed to wear a mask. And I believe, for example, in New York City during a protest, um, I don't. I know it used to be on the books. You cannot wear a mask because the police want to identify people to be in case you commit a crime, in case something happens. They need to identify people, and so we've been calling on campuses to enforce the laws. If you are not allowed to wear a mask in that city or on a campus, that needs to be enforced. What I also mean by the masks are on is that we're seeing people using the internet to hide behind, where they're posting anti-Semitic comments, uh, content, and they're trying to post uh, anonym anonymously and try to, to make threats. And so they're hiding their faces physically, they're wearing a mask and also using the computer to mask what they're, what they're doing as well. And so these are just, and I'm, you know, I'm sure this is not new to everyone here. These are just some of the ways that we're seeing, uh, you know, the experiences of, of college students on many, many college campuses today, too many. And so how are students dealing with this? How are they getting support? And so for our community, for Stand With Us, as an example, we're seeing, we're helping two, with two streams of support. There's the responsive support. So that comes to, you know, mobilizing students to uh, respond to something, to come to an event, uh, to take a certain action, confronting anti-Semitism. And within that, we also include the legal fight where we have through our legal center attorneys who on a pro bono basis are defending, are advocating, are writing briefs, they're writing letters to, to universities. Um, shortly after October 7th, we sent the letter to, oh, I think about 3000 college campuses. And we told them of the things that we need them through the administrative actions that we need universities to take in order to protect Jewish students on college campuses. Um, we, this includes making sure that we are letting them know of various policy violations that we're seeing uh, take place, calling for the protection, and at the same time, preparing for Title VI cases. For those of you who might not be familiar with Title VI, it's the uh, federal code that protects, um, ensures that students, minority students especially, and including Jewish students, are protected and can be in a safe learning uh, environment. And I can send the exact link, but that, you know, for our purposes, in a nutshell, is uh, is Title VI. And just on that note, when we talk about the legal front, when we talk about all the incidents that we're seeing in a normal year, our legal team, our Center for Combating Anti-Semitism would be responding to and dealing with approximately 400 incidents over the course of the year, right? And that can be something like, you know, again, we just need to write a letter to someone, or it could be an extreme case like we've seen where there's an assault. In just the last month, just the last month, since October 7th, so a little more than a month now, 
we have been dealing with over 500 incidents. So just remember, just think about that. In the course of a year, it would be an average of about 400 over the course of a year. In just these past six weeks, we've been dealing with over 500 incidents on, on college campuses. One of the things that we've also been doing is, you know, the stories that make the news are the big schools, right? Where it's a, a Harvard, a Tufts, a Columbia, a NYU, a UCLA, a University of Michigan. And we, of course, are there. We're providing the resources. We're providing the, uh, the support that the students need. But we're also there for the little guys. We're also there for the schools that people might not know about. So when there was a teacher, a professor at Mitchell Hamline uh, School of Law in Minnesota. Um, and they reached out to us because she was dealing with all kinds of anti-Semitism at the school. We got involved and we helped. And so we are working just this past year, and this goes back even, you know, pre-October 7th, we are working with over 270 uh, college campuses. And like I said, the big ones and the little ones. Um, we're there on the ground not just from a 30,000 foot view, but really on the ground. And as an example, when just last week, when UC Santa Barbara um, passed a resolution to condemn Hamas, we had our students, we were working with our students, not just giving them, you know, on an email saying, here are the, uh, you know, here's the information, here are your talking points, uh, you know, go out, make us proud and, and let us know how it goes. Our campus manager who covers UC Santa Barbara was there on the campus, with the students, helping them with their arguments as they were debating the resolution, helping them to make sure they had everything and really staying with them. And sometimes at cases like this, they can be staying with them until two, three in the morning, really making sure that we're not just giving them information, but that we're actually standing with them um, until the end. And thankfully the resolution passed. Uh, UC Santa Barbara last week passed the resolution to, uh, to condemn Hamas. We are providing alumni and donor support. So when something happens on a college campus, we can work with our partners at Alums for Campus Fairness to mobilize alumni uh, to get involved, to mobilize the, you know, in many cases, donors to reach out to the universities. Um, and we've seen over the last few weeks, especially since October 7th, on a number of college campuses, you've had many, many donors who have pulled back uh, their funding or have said they're not gonna, they're not gonna give funding. Um, and so that also is uh, is an important aspect. And so those are some of the things that we're doing to in response um, to what was going. So to providing that responsive support. One of the other things that we're doing um, is helping to facilitate communities of support. And what does that mean? That can mean bringing various programs and speakers uh, to the college campuses to educate and, and focus on different topics. It could be tabling, right? Setting up a table on the quad or on, on one of the pathways, of course, with the approval of going through all the regulations of the university um, and just you know handing out information. We had one of our speakers who was tabling at a number of universities, um, whether it was Northeastern or Brown, and just talking and engaging with students as they're walking by, having the conversations and, you know, really being able to educate people. We're not talking about the people who are hardcore, you know, anti-Israel and, and you know, anti-Semitic. We're not necessarily looking to to engage those students because they're, they're not willing to have the conversation. But the average student who doesn't know, those are the students who were able to engage during these conversations. And those are the students who we can, you know, bring over um, to support uh, the Jewish students on the college campuses. It can mean, um, as we've seen on a number of college campuses, installations for the hostages, right? So having up, you know, these, the flyers, putting up these, uh, you know, the empty, uh, the empty tables, right, that we've seen. I know, I think the Boston Commons just had uh, hosted it this past Friday night, um, where they had the empty table of the 240 um, uh, hostages that are still being held by Hamas. It means doing things with our interfaith partners on college campuses and working, for example, with the Hindu student groups that are on many college campuses. And they have been some of the most vocal pro-Israel, anti-anti-Semitism uh, students um, and even community as a whole. And so working with those partners, working with Christian students um, who are on the college campuses, helping to put together rallies, uh, pro-Israel rallies, 
and rallies that condemn anti-Semitism. We've seen on a number of campuses where, for example, at UPenn, uh, our Emerson Fellow, our campus fellow on the campus, led a rally of over 500 students. Um, we know at, at Harvard, I believe, during the first or second week since the attack, there was a, a large rally and vigil um, that was held at Harvard as well. So being able to support our students um, in those ways as well is that, you know, helping to build that community of, uh, of support on campus. I had mentioned before some of the issues that we see when it comes to professors. And even before October 7th, the professors have really been some of the people who have been causing the most problems, right? Because they are, you know, first of all, they have control over a grade. Um, if if students see that they're supporting something, they might not want to go against that, or they and they might just want to join in because they want the professor to see, hey, yeah, this is something that I'm a part of, and you know, I agree. Um, we have seen that they, on too many occasions, will abuse um, academic freedom and you know push an agenda or spread false information and. You know, very often they don't, there aren't any consequences or they're tenured, so consequences are are even harder. And sometimes we've even seen that professors are involved in some of these disruptions that we see across the country. And so, and I'll give, there was one campus um, where we've seen this again, even before October 7th, where departments, the, the, the departments were, the official listservs um, for the departments were used to spread, you know, these lies and to spread propaganda. And so if you had it, we've seen times where there was a chair of a department who had, you know, an email list for the entire department and would spread information, sometimes things that have nothing to do, you know, with the department. If it was a Middle East studies department, you know, maybe you could make the case, okay, they're, you know, they're talking, it's relevant, they're talking about something that is, uh, uh, you know, connected to the topic, but very often that's not the case. Um, and so when we have seen things like that happen, we do try to hold them accountable. We do reach out to the higher authorities to ensure that something like that can't happen again. I know there was one school, and I'm forgetting which one it was, where I believe the um, professor actually lost the ability to send out uh, emails for a while. Everything had to be vetted first by, um, I don't know if it was the provost or, or one, of the, uh, one of the higher ups to make sure that things were not um, things were not happening, things were not being done to abuse, um, the power. Um, and so, you know, that is one of the, some of the things is, uh, of what we've been seeing happening. One of the other ways that we're helping students, and I think I can actually put this in the chat. So here we go. If this works is, you know, because we've been seeing all these disruptions that are happening on the campuses, because we're seeing that very often students don't know, um, you know, where, where to go, um, what to, where exactly to, um, you know, what the process is, um, how they can uh, actually file these reports. Sorry, that was just sent to a direct message. We're gonna put it out to everyone. There we go. Um, so this is a, it's a quick sheet, a fact sheet of what to do to try to prevent disruptions on a campus at your event. What happens if they um, do disrupt, what you can do, how do you file a report? Um, and this is something that, we you know, recently created and we wanted to make sure that students have this information, they know what to do in advance and they know what to do if something does happen so we can hold people accountable for disrupting campus life. One of the other materials that we have, and this is something that uh, we had out even before October 7th, is something called Know Your Rights. It's a booklet that students um, have been using to be able to know what they can and can't do on a campus. If something happens, what do I do? How do I prevent things? And so these are things that we have put out. They are used by other organizations as well. And these are things that have also been used for high schools um, because a lot of the information is the same. And unfortunately, there have been times where we've seen high school events that have been, that have been disrupted. And so this is just, again, two examples right now of of uh of information that we've put out to help students again proactively and reactively uh you know deal with the situation one of the the sorry alice you wanted to say something i just wanted to for those of you who may not know if you go to the chat and click the link that abby has put in the visual he would have shown will pop up 
so you can see what Avi's talking about. And I'm sorry for interrupting you, no. Avi, but I'm I'm not sure everyone realized they could do that. Sure. Yeah. So in the in the chat, as Alice said, there are two links that are there, and it's a, it's links to two different resources that we have that we created for students, for our partners to be able to, like I said, deal with a lot of the disruptions that unfortunately we've seen happening on the college campuses over over the last month, and even uh, these are some of the ways that we've been helping students even before um, October seven deal with a lot of the uh, disruptions that are there. Um, one of the other resources that we we have available, and this is something that is uh, even beyond the college campuses, is the work that's happening on social media, especially for college students, high school students, and, and even middle school students. They're all on their phones, they're all on computers, they're all on devices, and they're getting information uh, from social media. They're not, you know, watching the mainstream news. They're on Instagram, they're on Snapchat, they're on TikTok, they're on Facebook, they're on Twitter, they're on many, many other platforms that I don't even know what those platforms are or how they even work, but they're there um, and they're getting information. And we know that the anti-Semites are putting out a lot of information as well. So we want to make sure that we are a part of that conversation as well that students and even people beyond uh, a student level are getting information. And so over the last you know, six weeks uh, through the various social media platforms, we've been able to engage over 500 million people uh, around the world. And that includes people like someone like Kylie Jenner, who actually shared some of our materials until she deleted it after getting some flack. It includes people like a Justin Bieber. It includes people like Amy Schumer. It includes people like various elected officials who have been using um, our materials or sharing our materials, our posts that we're putting on there. So the information goes viral. And so that when students click on something or they Google, you know, tell me about what's going on, very often they will see some of the posts that we're posting. And we try to make sure that the information, the truthful information can make it to the top of the feed. So it's not that you have to keep on scrolling because very often, right, students will check something, they'll see the first few things that are on their screen, and then that's it. And so we want to make sure that our the information is uh, is there at the top and that people can have what they need. We're also, and this will be one of the last things I'll, I'll comment on, and then I'd love to have a conversation with everyone and, and uh, answer questions. We work in partnerships. We're not an organization that can do it alone um, or that does it alone. And any organization that can or says they can, this would have been solved a long time ago. And so we we value our partnerships. We work with many, many different organizations. We had over 700 partnerships around the world last year, leveraging what we all bring to the table to make a difference. So whether it's uh, you know local Hillel's, a Chabad, AEPI, uh, the Federation, uh, CAMRA, APAC, um, AJC, ADL, we try to partner with as many different groups as possible, depending on the issue, right? Some groups will be stronger on some issues. Some groups, uh, you know, will work with on, an, on another issue. Um, but so we we very much value the partnerships. And it's something that has been able to really help us make a difference because you have groups, for example, like a Hillel or a Chabad that's actually physically on the campus. That's where the students are very often congregating. They know the campus climate and they invite us in to work with the students, to work with the, the to make a difference on the, uh, on the campus. And very often with high schools, right? It'll be a Jewish student union or a teacher um, that's inviting us in. And sometimes it's a local professor or another organization uh, that's inviting us in. And so we value the partnerships and it's something that we need to be, uh, we need to be seeing more of and, and doing more with to really continue um, in a collaborative and unified effort to, to try to make a difference and push back against this uh, really scary anti-Semitic wave uh, that we're seeing. And so I wanna uh, leave time to open uh, for Q&A and have a conversation and elaborate even more on things that um, people want me to, to speak about. This is, the, this is the part I love about these kinds of talks is the Q&A to really have a conversation and see um, what people are, are talking about and wanna hear more of. So, um, Alice and David, if, if that's okay, I'm happy to pause and, and open up to, to questions, however you want to facilitate that. Well, uh, we've gotten a, a couple of questions uh, where people are asking what 
what the Jewish community and what various uh, temple communities uh, who are participating tonight, what can they do to help with the situation on college campuses? Uh, or, or are they the appropriate people to get involved in college campuses? So I think there are, there are a number of things, and I, I touched upon uh, one of them earlier, is when we talk about helping local college students, depending on you know where you are, I would imagine there are you know, some people in this meeting who went to college in, you know, to a local college. And by local, right, I'm talking about something in the greater Boston area or know people who are in on some of the campuses. You might have kids who are on, you know, some of the campuses locally. Um, the community matters. And when, especially if you are an alum um, or, for example, you know someone who is a trustee of University X or, or College Y, make sure they're hearing from the community. Make sure they're hearing from the people who who support the college campuses. Um, college campuses very often, right, do not like bad press. Um, they don't want to lose funding, and so to the extent that you, as a as a synagogue community, um, for example, can make your voice heard, can reach out and even share. You know, if there's a, a letter campaign that an organization like Stand with Us, hypothetically speaking, is is launching, right? forward that to, to your university contacts, be in touch with the local Hillel to find out what are they doing, right? How are they mobilizing um, the local community to, to get involved? Um, and so those are definitely some things right off top of the bat. Alumni make a difference. Um, reaching out to local trustees um, are definitely important. And, and I would imagine, you know, various synagogues know who, um, you know, local trustees to universities um, are and, and can try to make a difference that way. Uh, you have, uh, you have examples or templates of letters that people could write to university officials? Yes. Uh, yes. I, I can send, there was something I know we were sending out to students and I can send that as one of the links. Um, after I can send a letter, a recent letter that we sent, um, you know, as an example, um, which is actually just today to University of Michigan, um, but I can send a template um, in the email afterwards. Okay, you can send it to me, and I can I can uh, circulate it. Perfect. Uh, and uh, let's say you uh, your college isn't nearby; it's across the country. Uh, how can people find out what what's going on on uh, you know on distant campuses? Is is stand with us a, a possible resource for finding out what's going on? Or Absolutely. They... Okay. So two. So and I would say two things on that. First of all, um, and I know this has really popped up even more since October seventh. But there have been many, many um, parent groups. Um, I think they're called right. Whether it's right. I know there's a main one that's been going around online. Mothers Against Campus Anti-Semitism. But there are many, many other uh, groups that have been formed by parents of students you know who are attending different universities and and they're these parents are spread out across the country they're not all in one area and so they're but they're focusing on right what's happening on their on their campus regarding the jewish communities i'm actually a part of a number of them whether it's uh michigan tufts columbia um there are many many of these groups that are there uh, many of them are on facebook so i definitely urge you you can probably you know find them um by googling there's a moderator so you definitely have to be accepted but these are groups that are posting what's happening on the campuses what are some of the actions but stay with us as well we have campus staff who are situated across the country they're on the ground in different regions and they are overseeing the campuses in their region they're building partnerships with the students they're building partnerships with the various partners we work with to ensure they have the proper resources and support and so it's definitely also a resource that can be used to try to find out hey i want to apply to uh my son or daughter wants to apply to campus x it's on the other side of the country or or you know a totally different city can you tell me what's happening can you tell me um you know how things have been uh going regarding the Jewish community. And that's something that we can, uh, information that our staff can provide as well. And it's something that I can uh, provide as well. If, if anyone, uh, you know, reaches out, I'm happy to connect with the right email. Um, and I can put my email for anyone in the chat as well. And that's something that David and Alice, you can also send out um, as a follow-up. Happy to help provide people with the information from the various campuses. Uh, does Stan with us get involved uh, at the high school level? Yes. 
So this is something that we started really doing uh, about 12 or 13 years ago. Um, so just like we have a fellowship program for college students, we also have a an internship program uh, for high school students. And this is something that is, like I said, in some of the Jewish day schools, in many of the public high schools, um, just for example, locally, I know we are we have students and we work closely with the schools in Newton, in Sharon, in Brookline, in Needham, in Natick, in Marblehead, um, in many, many other, I'm blanking on some of the regions now, but we're working not just with the students themselves, but we're working with superintendents. Uh, we're working with state and local elected officials in order to ensure, because the state and local elected officials are the ones who have the say when it comes to education. And so if there is an issue happening within the education space, if there's a law that we need passed, if there's a, a loophole somewhere that we need closed in order to protect Jewish students, we are working with those uh, policymakers as well. And so, yes, we are dealing, we're working with the high school students to proactively educate them, but to also help them respond when uh, when we see things happen. And unfortunately, in our high schools, there definitely have been things over the years that have been uh, that have been happening that we've been helping students and parents, uh, for that matter, deal with in the school. Uh, as far as students' personal safety, uh, have have uh, campus police or campus security, have they been cooperative? Um, depend, I was, I'll say this, depending on the campus, um, there have been cases where, uh, you know, things have happened and we, you know, our students have alerted the campus police in advance and they've been able to, you know, prevent the uh, disruptions. They've been able to try to keep the, uh, you know, all students safe. Unfortunately, we've seen too many cases where either the police, the campus police didn't intervene. It took a long time to intervene. They didn't take things seriously. And that's when we had to get our legal teams involved uh, to make sure that the things uh, that we needed dealt with, um, you know, from a police perspective uh, were dealt with. And so um, it, it really does, I think, depend on the campus and even the incident uh, that happened. I know it's not the best answer, but that's that's what we've been seeing. There, there's a the concern that I've had that um, as students uh, feel uh, afraid of being confronted in the dining halls or on campus, uh, that they tend to gravitate to Hillel, uh, and many Hillels are accommodating them by offering more meals. Um, there's a concern that the Jews will be sort of creating a ghetto for themselves on campus um, uh, by because they're being intimidated. Um, what what's the best uh, answer to that problem? What's what's the best way that uh, students can keep that from happening? Well, it's not an easy question. I realize. No, I mean, look, I I don't think we want to. We definitely don't want to. You know discourage students from uh from going to Hillel. I mean Hillel was uh was set up to be the center for Jewish life uh on college campuses. Um you know and so and really to provide Jewish students right with their right with an area where they can right be together with other Jews and, and whether it's you know services or food or or whatever it is just to have that that Jewish space um on campus. Um so I you know I definitely don't think we definitely want to make sure that students are partaking of that. But one of the things we've also, you know, been encouraging our students to do is, you know, in an area where you do feel safe and going through the proper procedures, have events, uh, you know, in, in a public, in a public space, reserve the room, um, make sure that, you know, you do have a, a police presence, that you do have proper security. Um, but it's, it's, you know, we definitely want to, of course, of course, first and foremost, make sure that our students uh, are safe. Um, and again, it's it's not just a matter of physical safety, right? If if that's just the standard, then yeah, for the most part, right? Students have been physically safe um, on campuses, but they should not have to feel emotionally unsafe. They shouldn't have to feel anxious uh, walking to class or even being in a class. Um, and so that is something that we have been talking to administrations about as well, is that the entire climate um, has to be a climate of safety as well 
uh, for our students, just like you would try to create it for other students uh, on campus. We're not asking for special treatment. We're asking for the same treatment um, applied across the board. Uh, on some campuses, the uh, the campus DEI uh, program or DI effort has uh, has not always uh, been receptive to uh, you know uh, fighting anti-Semitism. Uh, can you share any experiences that you've had on that front, and and any advice you could share? Sure. So. Unfortunately, as was said, you know, the, the DEI space, the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, space on too many campuses and even beyond the campuses. We've seen this also in, you know, the corporate world in some cases as well, has not been very accepting of Jews, uh, of the Jewish experience. And we'll leave it, you know, for lack of, of better terms. Um, there are cases where, and we've seen, we've had conversations with some of the DEI uh, you know, coordinators, directors, depending on what the title is on the specific place, where it, it wasn't done necessarily maliciously, um, but there have been many cases where, yes, it, it has been done uh, maliciously for a variety of reasons. We can go into the, you know, to, you know, DEI and, and why um, it was set up and sort of why it comes out that the Jews don't fit into that space. But you know, we look at it in many ways as, again, it's another department. And just like we would hold the, you know, the Middle Eastern Studies Department accountable for, you know, spreading propaganda or any other university official responsible, the same thing with DEI. And I'll give an example. There was a campus, um, and this was last year, where a student, a Jewish student, was facing uh, anti-Semitic bullying and harassment. And the DEI coordinator um, at the school blamed the student for the anti-Semitism and essentially said it was it was her fault uh, that that this happened. And not only that, but took the side of the anti-Semite, um, who in this case happened to have been uh, a Muslim student on the campus. And once we mobilized um, our students, the the some donors that we knew at the university, uh, alumni, etc., not only was the DEI coordinator fired um, because of this, but new policies were put in place to try to prevent things like this from happening again, to ensure that anti-Semitism uh, was part of DEI teachings, not just as a standalone unit, but the same way they teach about other uh, communities and tolerance of other communities and, and the experiences of other communities Jews are are going to be included in the same way. So we we have seen cases like that where we are able to see changes, where we are able to hold DEI um, you know, officials and and coordinators accountable. Um, and it's something that is that is ongoing, and and we need to continue to uh, speak out about. But yes, it's unfortunately on many campuses the DEI um, departments um, have not been helpful when it comes to fighting anti-Semitism and, and you know, very often they are excluding Jews as opposed to including them. Uh, some people are trying to get a handle on how widespread the problem is on any particular campus. Uh, sometimes it seems as though uh, a fairly small minority, but very vocal and very aggressive uh, is is drawing a lot of attention to themselves, but that they don't represent uh, the you know the vast majority of the students. Um, is that true in many cases? Is that uh, uh, or are there campuses where there's overall there's a uh, there's a feeling of hostility? So I, I think you know to your point we in many many of the cases and I'll even you know I think it's accurate to say the majority of the cases that we're seeing um, it's not the majority of the campus that is you know participating uh, in these events in these disruptions uh, in in the protests a lot of these groups you know when we for example when we say students for justice in palestine or sjp which is you know the group that's been out there um that has been pushing a lot of these 
protest a lot of these disruptions, and I know they've already been suspended in for different amounts of time on a, on a number of campuses because of you know the the disruptions and because of you know policies that they're breaking on campuses. Um, sometimes these quote unquote SJP chapters are a handful of students, um, but because number one they're very loud, um, because they're very you know they will get in your face, and number two. What the anti-Israel and anti-Semitic groups on college campuses have done over the years is that they've built relationships with many of the other uh, groups on college campuses, all right? And they've made this, what's called this intersectionality, where they're able to, you know, compare, uh, or, or not compare, but to show how their cause um, is, is our cause, right? Meaning that the two causes that they are talking about. So, for example, when it came to, you've had many of these groups that talked about, you um, you know, when, um, I forgot, in, in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, um, right back in 2016, I believe this was, and this is when sort of, you know, Black Lives Matter became a much more prominent uh, uh, organization, a more prominent cause, right? What was what were we seeing on college campuses? We were seeing the phrases from Gaza to Ferguson, right? Talking about, and what they're making the comparison, right? That just like, in their words, just like Israel will, uh, you know, abuse and and purposely uh target the uh Palestinians the 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 Arabs that are that are there the police do the same thing here and because Israel trains uh you know police here in America therefore it's you know all the same and it's it's the same cause right that's just that's just one example um we saw a case at Columbia University where you had there was a, a group that was formed that was to support um, people have been uh, victims of uh, of sexual harassment and sexual assault, and one of the one of the leaders of the group um, got up and said, "Well, you know, we should also be supporting the uh, women in the you know the Palestinian women who are being harassed and 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 abused by by Israel as well. So we have to support you know all these causes, otherwise we're not being true to the cause." Thankfully, we actually had there was another student there who said, you know, look, we can we can have our disagreements or you know not like what Israel was happening in Israel, but I don't understand what supporting women over there has to do with you know women here who have been the victims of uh, of sexual assault or sexual uh, harassment. Uh, and so again, that's just another example of how you've seen these groups try to build these connections and try to build these relationships with other student groups so that they get more students involved. And so it makes it look like more of the students, uh, you know, population um, is involved. But when you're talking about a campus that has, you know, thousands of students, um, you know, the students who are protesting, it's first of all, the numbers, it's not the majority, but it is definitely a very, very, very loud uh, minority and it's intimidating. It's intimidating when you see tens of students, even hundreds of students, um, who are who are protesting, even if they don't fully believe what they're protesting or they know fully what they're protesting, they're involved in it. And you see your friends, right, who you might share a dorm with or us on your floor who's there. It's intimidating. And especially when they are, you know, breaking the policies, when they're breaking the rules, when they're preventing you from going to class. Um, it it creates that climate uh, that we talked about that is that is intimidating that is that is you know fearful um, and that you know makes our students feel like they're they're isolated because more it seems more and more of them are speaking up than uh, or and are louder uh, than our side. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm looking at some additional uh, questions coming in. Uh, is a uh, is there a, an opportunity then being missed uh, by Jewish students on campus and not forming these these relationships uh, with other groups? Uh, is there um, is there any uh, prospect that intersectionality can be uh, worked in our favor? So I, I, we definitely have seen examples where Jewish students have built you know, relationships that, you know, with many of the other groups on campuses, and it's worked in our favor. Um, you know, for example, at Rutgers University in New Jersey, when there was a display about, about the Holocaust, 
uh, that was, you know, on display, I think it was outside the, um, the AE Pi house, the Jewish fraternity uh, on campus. And it was vandalized. It was vandalized the, the next day. The student group that came out strongest in condemning the vandalism um, and coming out in support of the Jewish community was the Hindu group on campus um, because there were relationships that were built. And we've seen this also with many of, of, of our Christian students on campuses and even in some cases with some of the Hispanic student groups uh, on college campuses. And so there are, we have seen examples where because of these relationships, we've been able to uh, have a stronger voice on our side and prevent a lot of the anti-Israel, anti-Semitic things uh, that are happening. Um, but I will say, you know, I think that, you know, unfortunately, at least for now, um, the other side does seem to have done uh, a better job and certainly at getting the louder students um, to speak up. But it, it's definitely something that we need to see more of in terms of our students building these relationships um, so that, you know, we build these friendships and allyships so that when something happens, we have the support and it doesn't feel like students are, Jewish students shouldn't have to feel like they're alone because we have these friends. You know, there's this, uh, this dilemma that uh, young people face when they're applying to, uh, to college, uh, where uh, they, they have to decide whether they want to avoid campuses where there uh, where there's a bad atmosphere, or whether they want to intentionally go to those campuses so that they can engage in in uh, in the good work that you support. Um, is there a is there an encouraging word we can say to those who are in the latter category um, that uh, if they go there they have a chance of uh, changing the campus culture from within. Yes. So first of all, there, there's a whole network on many of the college campuses. There's a network of support that exists, whether it's Stand With Us, whether it's Hillel, whether it's Chabad, whether it's Pi, whether it's you know a plethora of other organizations. There are organizations that are there to, to support students. So no student should feel like they are alone. And there are very often, depending on the campus, other students who are there uh, to support. There's a network uh, that's there. And so connecting students I would say in advance. And that's something that we do, for example, when our high school students graduate and they're going off to campus, we make sure that they know in advance who is the campus manager for that region, who are our student leaders, who, where is the, you know, who are the contacts that they can reach out to. And so it's something that anyone who's having, you know, their their child or grandchild apply to a college campus to know that there is a network out there and that if they do decide to go to a campus where they know there is a lot of uh, potential hostility, uh, you know, towards Israel um, on the campus, um, you know, to make sure that they they are, are hooked into that network so they have that support. I would also say that there is no reason why, when applying to the campus, to let the university know that, you know, your student, that your child is going there and you are, you know, calling on them to ensure that he or she is protected, to make sure that they are aware that, that this is an issue and that people are watching. Um, and even ask the administrators, right? What is the situation when it comes to anti-Semitism on campus? Um, make sure they know that that's an important thing and that if they actually want to take students, you know, and if they want students to come from this school um, or from their usual schools, that they have to deal with this. Um, and so I, you know, going back to what you said, definitely there is that network that's out there. And so that students, no matter which campus they're going to, can feel that they have the support and are not just there fighting this alone. Well, uh, the message I'm, I'm hearing from you is that uh, whether we are uh, alumni or parents or, or students in college or high school, the, uh, the important thing is to raise our profile. Uh, to get out there and listen to what, what's happening and to make our feelings known, make our opinions known. Yep. And uh, I think uh, I've visited your website, standwithus.com, and I know that there are some, there are excellent materials there uh, that people can utilize and use to, uh, 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 within the community and to forge relationships with other organizations. Uh, Alice, I'm going to uh, uh, turn this over, back over to you if you have any questions that you'd like to ask. Um, 
I do have a question and then I want to thank everyone. Avi, you mentioned you stand with us, post things on social media. Yes. Whether it be middle schoolers, high schoolers, or college kids, we need to know what social media you're posting on. Because a lot of them are looking and they're not seeing. Um, I had a mi middle schooler comment to me on great social media sites and I was appalled. So where are you posting? So it's posting on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, um, on uh, on Snapchat, on, I believe it's called Telegram. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of different social media platforms where we are constantly posting throughout the day. Um, you know, videos, information, links, fact sheets, um, you know, to make sure that we try to, you know, that we get this information out there. It's very often depending on the platform translated into different languages. So we, you know, also have stand with us um, in Arabic on many of these, uh, on many of these platforms. Um, and so, in fact, one of our largest followings um, is the Arab world, where we have a lot of uh, people from all these various countries who are showing support, who are, you know, sending us all kinds of messages saying they support Israel, saying they are so upset about what's happening, uh, which is not something we often hear about, you know, in the news. Um, but this is something that we're, you know, we're posting on, on all these different platforms to try to reach uh, this wider, wide, uh, you know, array of, uh, of people. Um, in fact, when I, when I, you know, when someone, we told someone the number that we were able to engage over 500 million people, one of the, someone said to us, you know, why can't we go beyond the Jewish community? Why can't we, uh, you know, just stop to, to ourselves? I said, I wish there were 500 million Jews in the world. That would be, uh, that would be amazing. Um, so we, we do have that reach and it, we're posting, like I said, on all these platforms. And if someone's having an issue, uh, seeing it, let me know and I'll make sure that they are, uh, you know, connected to the, uh, to the right place. Well, Avi, I want to thank you because not being able to see you and just <laughs> listening, almost all the people on the Zoom stayed on which is exceptionally unusual, even when you have visuals. So it's nine o'clock and we wanna honor everyone's time and your time. So thank you very much to Avi and to all of you who stayed on. Um, again, I think it's so important that this was an inter-synagogue event from Western Massachusetts to Lexington to Southern Massachusetts. And I hope for those of you from other synagogues on this and temples, let us know when you're doing things because I'm Yisrael Chai and we need to stand up together and learn together. So have a good evening and thank you for coming. And David, was there anything? Else? Oh, you will receive a recording of this. We will send Abby's um, slides that he was going to show tonight. And I don't think there was anything else we were going to send. David, is there anything you would like to add? Right, uh, we, will, uh, we will share those materials uh, send them to the email that you use to register for the event. Right. So thank you and good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.